and gentlemen, men, <laughs> we're going to start uh, this um, uh, extremely exciting uh, session of Curious tonight. Uh, I am a, I'm Dr. Aude Le Guenec, and I've got the immense pleasure to uh, chair the panel um, entitled Uncovering Argyle's African Collection. So if you're not here for this presentation, then <laughs> you might decide whether you want to stay or just run away. But <laughs> I invite you to stay, because what best on a dull Friday, Scottish Friday <laughs> evening than traveling to Eastern Africa and uh, unraveling all these uh, amazing, incredible, and vibrant paintings that have been collected um, um, and um, collected in the, the 1960s, 1970s, and uh, were dedicated to the education of young Scots to um, the art around the world. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the Royal Society of Edinburgh for this uh, curious event. Um, where, as I said, we will uncovering this uh, Argyle African art collection and know more about it with our fantastic panel of speakers. I have always dreamt to be doing a little bit of housekeeping. <laughs> I've never done it. <laughs> it's the first for me. So, um, please note, there is no fire drill expected, which is a relief, but... If the alarm goes off, please follow the curious staff with a purple t-shirt and they will indicate where to go uh, nicely, calmly and all together. Uh, the assembly point is on George Street outside the dome so you can stick, still just go escape and have a nice tea there. Right, uh, but no, I, please, as I said, stay here. Um, as I mentioned, today's event is part of Curious, which is the RSE's summer event program taking place between the 4th and the 17th of September and features events from talks to tours, workshops to exhibitions. This year's theme is Under the Surface, which is to encourage you to delve deeper, questions further and look again. So today, that's exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to travel uh, through art history and through this amazing public engagement project. So today, we're going to hear about this project thanks to, his, uh, um, thanks to the, uh, the principal investigator, if I can uh, speak like that, Dr. Kate Kircher, who is here and uh, she's going to join us as a first speaker. She's a lecturer in art history at the University of St Andrews and a member of the Young Academy of Scotland. So a tribute to the Young Academy of Scotland, uh, where I am a member as well and ex-co-chair. She holds degrees from the University of Edinburgh, the Courtauld Institute of Art and Stanford University. Her research and teaching encompass the modern and contemporary arts of Africa. And she's currently, I still almost finished, <laughs> writing her book, uh, which is called Beyond the Feud of Fog, Art and Revolution in Ethiopia. Since 2018, she has led a research collaboration with Argyle and Butte Council, investigating the African artwork in the Argyle collection, which is the purpose of the uh, panel tonight. And she curated the exhibition Dart the Noon, Modern African Art from the Argyle Collection at the Nunbara Hall, which, again, you will know more about in a minute. We have the honor as well to um, welcome uh, <coughs> Professor Angelo Kakande, um, who is an associate professor at the Margaret Troll School of Industrial and Fine Arts, Makerere University in Uganda. And uh, uh, Professor Kakande is an artist, is an art historian, is a lawyer. He's currently, as I said, 
uh, an associate professor, and uh, he's an expert in histories of modern and contemporary art in East Africa. particularly engaged with the ways in which art functions in the defense of individual and collective rights. In sep septem September 2023, so this month, he's a visiting global fellow in the School of Art History at the University of St. Andrews, and I think he's embarked in a journey in Scotland where he's exploring a lot of resources for his own research and contributes a lot to the art history department at St. Andrews. We are also extremely lucky to have here Professor Christina Young, uh, who is director of the Kelvin Center for Conservation and Cultural Heritage Research at the University of Glasgow. Uh, Professor Young teaches and conducts technical art history, research on easel paintings, and scientific research aimed at understanding and improving conservation methodologies and materials for cultural heritage. Previously, uh, Professor Young was a reader at the Courtauld Institute of Art and a Leverhulme Fellow at Tate. Her recent research focusing on, focuses on the methods and materials of Joy, uh, sorry, John Hoyland, excuse me, and Michael Armitage. Um, so she also took part in the Artudenen project, and she will uh, explain to you how she's, uh, pro she, she's operated the visual examinations of the exhibited paintings. Um, I think, without any further ado, we're going to invite our members of the panel to come and uh, present this project on the African art collection at uh, Buttes and Argyle. Thank you. Sorry, I should say that we're going to keep all the questions until the end of the presentations, and uh, you will then be invited to uh, ask your questions to the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Aud. Thank you so much, Aud. Um, and before I start this evening, I have to say an enormous thank you to um, partners and colleagues, uh, particularly from Argyle and Butte, particularly those in Argyle and Butte Council who over recent years have provided uh, me with the opportunity to get to know this collection, originally with the wonderful Madeleine Conn, and more recently with both colleagues in the council and colleagues in the organisation Culture, Heritage, Argyle and Isles, or Charts, who are part of uh, a new partnership that's going to be rethinking the future of the Argyle collection. I would like in particular to thank Deirdre, who today drove a number of these artworks over here, literally arriving about eight minutes ago. One of them we unwrapped in time, Henry Tayali, <laughs> and I'll mention that a little further in a minute. So my name is Kate Coucher, and I thought just at the start this evening, I would, I would really just um, give you a little backstory to this project. Uh, and it started back in 2018 when I was first arrived at St Andrews, and I was looking for an example of a work by the Tanzanian artist Sam J. Antiro, who's a very important artist from Tanzania, but as Angelo will remind us, is an iconic artist in Uganda as well. He's uh, somebody who was famous internationally for being the first uh, uh, African artist to enter the collection of MoMA in the mid-1960s in New York. And it turns out that there is a work by him here in Scotland, and uh, somewhere rather unexpected. In 2018, it was in storage at Loch Gilped High School in Argyll and Butte. So when I found this on the internet, I reached out to our Garland Butte Council, and I was connected with Madeleine Conn, who was then the cultural coordinator, and she told me that there was a, a sort of cluster of artworks associated with Antiro, um, and that they all belonged to this thing called the Argyle Collection. Now, the Argyle Collection is something that was set up in 1960. It was the brainchild of Naomi Mitchison, who some of you may know, very Im uh, important writer, political speaker, campaigner, um, also uh, uh, owner of a, a remarkable house in Argyll and Butte and a Labour councillor on, on Argyll Council in the 60s. And she set up this 
uh, initiative. She persuaded the council to support this initiative, which would collect works of modern art to be owned by the council to circulate amongst the county's schools. Now, these are, these are schools that um, can be in fairly remote rural locations, um, quite far from major cities like Glasgow. So they're um, uh, school populations that might not get the opportunity to visit major national museums. And she wanted to take modern art, not necessarily um, always the easiest things to look at. What Mitchison liked were challenging things, things that would really get you thinking. And she partnered with a wonderful man, Jim Tyre, who was a school art teacher at the time, um, and he was responsible for driving the van around the county and taking the artworks to all the various schools. It was a very progressive and inclusive idea. Now, around the same time as she's doing all this work in Argyle, Mitchison also um, strikes up a friendship with a young man from what is now Botswana, was then Bechuana land, a man called Lintre II, who went on to become Kigozi, or chief of the Bagatla Bakagafela people, um, and she uh, and and Lin she becomes something of a maternal figure to Lynchway and ultimately a kind of advisor to him. And they have a very close relationship, testified by letters, in fact, that are held here in the National Library of Scotland. Um, and it's through Lynchway that she starts to make regular and extensive visits to East Africa. And in order to get to Botswana at the time, she's travelling through Kampala, she's travelling through Dar es Salaam, she's travelling through Nairobi, capital uh, cities of relatively new uh, young nations in East Africa. While she's making these journeys, she encounters, as Angelo is going to tell us about a little more in a minute, uh, a very exciting, young, dynamic art scene. And she starts to think that the Argyle collection should perhaps have some artworks from, uh, from this part of the world as well, that it might uh, pr sort of pr um, allow young people in Argyle to really get to know places that seem very far removed, perhaps, from where they're living, but places that she felt had things potentially in common. She used this term, build bridges of understanding, and she felt very strongly that these works should be, at the time, the most cutting-edge kind of modernist artworks. The first paintings that she buys come from an artist then based um, in Uganda, in Makerere University, Louis Azaria Mbaguni, who paints, he's an academically trained artist, and paints this rather remarkable, uh, richly coloured uh, sort of sea, uh, lakeside scene, nocturnal lakeside scene. And then um, uh, a young man, Hezbon Owiti, who's a self-taught artist. You don't get any of the sense of the texture of this painting, but it's a thick, impasto painting. Hezbon Owiti uh, was self-taught, but uh, got the opportunity to train in a workshop in, Niro um, in uh, Nigeria as well in the 60s. These are the first two that arrive in Scotland. They're exhibited at Loch Gilpet High School in the mid-1960s. And then she just buys more. So she keeps buying works at different um, exhibitions that she visits, different exciting cultural centres, like the Chem Chemi Creative Centre in Nairobi, at the um, University Art Gallery at Makerere. Um, she buys works uh, from a print show in Botswana. That's where the Lucky Sibia print there which comes from the story of the Zulu Macbeth. I can explain more about that later if you wish. Uh, so there's prints. There's this really beautiful painting by Henry Tayali, which those of you in the room can come and take a closer look at in a minute. Um, and there are other works like this, works on paper, which are wax crayon on paper works by the uh, self-taught Ugandan uh, master artist Jack Katrakawe. There is also a remarkable little cluster, some of which are in fact up here, of works that come from the very first class of printmaking students that graduate from Makerere in the mid-1960s. These are students educated in uh, etching, lithography, woodcut making, etc. And they're taught by a man called Michael Adams, who in the early 60s sets up the printmaking department with equipment imported from the Royal College of Art in London. So, the Argyle collection has quite a unique little cluster of these particular works. Now, when we started to dig into a little bit of uh, a backstory of these, in the archives in Argyle, we encountered uh, there are a few interesting letters and other bits of ephemera. One of the most striking things was to find this. Um, it's actually a photocopy of a photograph, but it is nonetheless a photograph of the artist Sam J. and Tiro that he himself personally mailed from Dar es Salaam with the intention that it be sent to the council offices in Danoon where the painting would be processed for the collection. So he knew when he posted this work in Dar es Salaam, addressing the envelope to Naomi Mitchison, 
concern, he knew where it was going to uh, Danoon in Argyle and Butte. Um, so we have a very, in, there's a very interesting kind of backstory here, but when we first started looking at this, the vast majority of these works, with the exception of Sam and Tiro, uh, these histories had sort of been lost to, to history. And this is in part because Mitchison's progressive vision ensured that these artworks lived outside of museums, but they did not always have, of course, in that case, an infrastructure behind them that might be able to keep track of all of their various histories and stories. And over the decades, there have been wonderful individuals who have done their best to preserve aspects of the collection's history and revive it at various points. But the uh, collection of African artworks in particular seemed to uh, come from a place that was very far away from Argyle, and therefore those histories seemed to start to fade into um, obscurity. So in 2018 and 2019, I had the privilege of working with two remarkable undergraduates from St Andrews, one of whom is on the front <laughs> row here tonight, and now works for Sotheby's, uh, Ellie Kim Logan. Uh, and the three of us together went over to Loch Gilpet and um, began to just physically examine the artwork, see if we could decipher signatures, see if we could piece together some of these histories and stories. Ellie Kem is the one who worked out that the signature here was Henry Tayali and who contacted colleagues in Zambia um, who were then able to confirm that attribution. And since that time, we've done a few things. We had an exhibition in 2021, a small exhibition showing what we had so far. It opened in the thick of a regional lockdown in Glasgow and uh, in the kind of difficult days of the summer of 2021. We couldn't have many people in the gallery, but nonetheless, we had a good number come along. We launched some online learning resources because a major part of this collection is its educational uh, role and the role that it can play. And the internet these days allows us to make these works not just available to schools in Argyll and Butte, but digitally, digitally to schools everywhere. So Art UK developed um, a, num a number of resources formatted to curricula across the UK. And then most recently, we've been focusing on questions of conservation and how we might look after these works and put in place, perhaps, things that will help this collection to uh, be made use of and loved and cherished for many, many, many more years to come. And um, in pursuit of that, I was able to connect with um, Professor Christina Young, who's going to share with you very shortly uh, the research that she's been doing a little bit this summer on the Sam and Tiro painting, Ooh, which is currently... Uh, in, her, in her workspace in Glasgow. One of the most exciting connections that we've been able to make is with colleagues at Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. And I'm incredibly honoured that uh, Dr. Angelo Kokande has been able to make the journey uh, from Kampala to be with us this month. We've had a wonderful two weeks with him in St. Andrews so far, uh, really inspiring us all in a lot of ways. And I wanted to invite him up here this evening to really enrich the conversation of the context of these artworks in terms of Uganda, Makerere University, University as a centre for modernist art production in the 60s. I'll hand over. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kate Koucher. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, first of all, I need to get this out of the way. I need to thank RSE they wrote a letter, and that letter helped me to get here. Um, so home affairs, I know you're watching, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and the letter came from here. <laughs> yeah, I needed the letter and a couple of other letters to get here. It wasn't so easy to get the visa. Yeah, and finally I'm here. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so what I'm going to do, uh, we're here to uncover. So I'm just going to uncover some little detail um, to make this point that Ntiro was as much a contributor to Uganda's modernism as he was a contributor to Tanzanian modernism. And he wasn't alone. So this um, a Uganda's modernism, which has Scottish art. So people of Scotland, you need to come and claim. <laughs> um, but we have a contribution from Zambia, from um, Malawi, from Kenya, from Sudan. Yes, so uh, the little detail I want to add is this complex modernism to which Sam Montero um, is an important actor. Um, and 
And it's very important that we go back that far, not because it is a starting point, but because it is a wonderful contribution we got. That's the family of Mrs. Margot Trow. Um, her husband is standing by, and the children they had while they were in East Africa. So Mrs. Margot Trow was a missionary, art educator, very, very passionate about inspiring the practice of modern art in Uganda, which was not country based, but regional based. So she attracted students from all over the place. Um, and that is how Mtiro comes to be um, in Uganda. Never mind, there was no Uganda as a country then with specific borders as you see them now. It was just a swath of land belonging to the British colony. So um, she was very active in this colony. So that is Mrs. Margot Trow and her family. And that is her teaching her African students. Um, they used to refer to her as Mrs. Margot Trow. In fact, the name Trow in Uganda is much more associated with Mrs. Margot Trow than it was with Dr. Hugh Trow, her husband. I guess because he was so much locked up into the medical school in Morago Hospital, and Mrs. Margot Trow was all over the place. Yeah. All right, so that is Gregory Maroga. So Mrs. Margot Trow, one of the first students he recruited at a professional level was Gregory Maroba. But before that, she had taught a number of students. Uh, that is because the instruction she was giving was what became to be a hobby course. Every student entered in Makere University. It wasn't a university then. It was uh, something between a university and something else. And every student admitted had to do something to do with art. Very, very nice practice, I guess. Um, the colonial administration had a different reason why that had to be done. It was sick and tired of students coming to the university and demanding jobs. <laughs> so it wanted them to be creative about life and how better way to do it than to teach them art. So there was everybody forced to do uh, um, fine art of sorts. Some were not so happy about it. Others were super <laughs> excited. So Maroba then, 1940, became the first professional student that she had to teach um, from Kenya. Samun Tiro um, is from Tanzania. Um, he was probably in the second cohort or third uh, from Tanganyika then. And um, he joined the student uh, body. And then uh, Njiao comes a little bit much later, 1954. Why am I showing these? Is because in 1947, Trow writes an article, Modern Art in East Africa. And then she says she was training art masters. So these then became the masters she was producing. Who was a master? Someone who is studying art for purposes of living as an artist. So these masters, very interestingly, in Uganda, they are masters. In Tanzania and Kenya, they are just the first generation of artists. And we have these arguments between us. We are, they are masters to us. Oh, no, no. They're just the first generation of artists. So um, Nchiro is a master in Uganda. Um, now, I had to bring this on board to make this point that in true Ntiro and others have contributed to Uganda's modernism. And I think it seems to be national at that level. I think it begins to be international and regional. This is from Galgani. That gentleman was maybe a refugee or oh, maybe he had been arrested during the Second World War. But while in detention in Uganda, he produces that, Delamene and his students. Delamene was a missionary. The students are indeed a reflection of the kind of uh, students who are taught by missionaries, catechism. But these could have gone as, maybe they were coming from Congo. <laughs> could have been. Uganda was Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and Bogazair. So, the reach was that far, so this could have been uh, from Congo. OK, I don't have evidence to confirm that. And I never spoke to the artist. But the point I'm making is this. The artwork is made by an Italian. It is identifiably Italian and Ugandan. And it is Ugandan. We claim it. <laughs> um, that is the independence monument. The artist is Gregory Maloba. Very, very significant artwork in Uganda. In fact, it is in my passport. It is the national currency. The artist is Kenyan. The artwork is Ugandan. And the modernism is Ugandan. <laughs> and 
and that is Peso Nlombe, not Ugandan at all. But the modernism is Ugandan. Now, why I want this is because the connection you see in the form. So Peso Nlombe is Maroba's student. So the child who is raising hand to celebrate the independence moment is probably Ugandan baby, but the influence, I think, to this uh, independence monument should have come in through Peso Nlombe, um, uh, who is not Ugandan, really. Uh, but the modernism is certain. And that second artwork um, is, uh, is at Makiri Art School. It will never be shipped home. <laughs> we will we'll maintain it. All I can encourage people from Zambia, hey, welcome. Come on. Your artwork <laughs> is in <laughs> People in Malawi, there you are. Your artwork is in Uganda. Um, now, this is where the Scottish people should come and claim their artwork in Uganda. The artist is Cecil Todd, uh, Professor Cecil Todd, uh, Scottish, certainly. But this is a coat of arms for Uganda. Very, very important artwork. He created it. Of course, there are no horses. Um, there are no cows and sheep. Uh, <laughs> the animals are probably Ugandan. Uh, the drum is certainly Ugandan. The crested crane is a very important symbol in Uganda. The artist is Scottish. Scottish people welcome. This is your artwork. It's as much <laughs> Scottish as it is um, Ugandan. And that is another Cecil Todd. It identified the Bank of Uganda. Um, very, very important. It's standing in front of the Bank of Uganda. It's a central bank. It uh, controls all currencies, and especially the Uganda currency. And uh, Scottish people, welcome. <laughs> uh, now we move on to Tayari. Zambia uh, will be interested. Uh, this is probably Zambian. <laughs> Uganda won't claim it, but th this particular <laughs> one, <laughs> this particular one, we claim it, uh, but we're willing to share it with uh, the Zambian people. Um, another one, um, bearing Kawunda. The name Kawunda is identifiably Zambian, uh, but the artwork is uh, Ugandan, uh, <laughs> so we can share. But not all modernism in Uganda has been created by uh, um, um, other nationals. Uh, this is the Ugandan, George Cheyune. Uh, the theme is uh, uh, not the villages and the weddings, but probably the village and the wedding, uh, in the sense that the commonest mode of transport in Uganda is a motorcycle. It's called a border border. Uh, and through this artwork, it has entered uh, uh, the, the, the modernism. And that is George Cheone, my own teacher. And in fact, he was trained for his PhD here. No, no, maybe, yeah, so was, so was. So here I mean UK, <laughs> not in Scotland. So that is, uh, uh, um, you can see that the Ugandans are also active and participating, creating their own modernism. That does not take away the fact that other nationals, including Sam Chiro, have contributed to it. Godfrey Banada, he retired recently. Uh, the theme here uh, is uh, the feminists have a serious problem with it. Uh, they have attacked it. I have a whole PhD <laughs> uh, with a chapter. They're angry. Uh, but his, uh, I think the argument being made is that artists like him and myself, we are trying to push back against the new woman who was created by the affirmative action which became law in Uganda in 1989. And women were finally out of the kitchen and into the public space. And the artists were not so happy with that. Go home. So this is part of the go home uh, uh, artworks. <laughs> and the feminists are not so happy with it. But that is Godfrey Bernard, contributing to Uganda's modernism, of course. Now, I need to make a prayer. I need to make a request. And the reason I make such a request when I face you, last time I was speaking to Dr. Kate Coucher, Man, we're not so sure what happened to Professor Cecil Todd. And guess what I learned today? There is a whole band of Cecil Todd somewhere. <laughs> so I love coming here <laughs> and saying something is missing. So something is missing. This artwork is in Macquarie University. It's a Sam Tiro. It is peeling off the wall. Uh, that's because Sam Tiro painted it on the wall. It is um, sad that it was placed in a dining a dining room, so you can imagine the steam, the cooking oil, everything. I think they affected the longevity of the painting. 
is peeling off. Uh, we need help. Um, that's another one. It's another Sam Tiro. Uh, his wife, Sarah Antiro, told me that it was about her own wedding. Uh, wedding is in Chagaland, it would have been the same. In fact, Dr. Kate Kaucha was telling me that there is another wedding in, uh, in MoMA. <laughs> and I was saying that the, the one in MoMA was probably from Chaga, this is from Uganda. <laughs> and, and, and his wife said pretty much the same. Um, that one is also peeling off. Um, uh, so um, any help we can get, uh, either to restore or stop the peeling off, we'll be so happy to, to get it. They are all, these are all in Makere University, but I think it doesn't have the, um, the resource envelope to, you know, to, to, to look at the process of ensuring that uh, these are saved uh, from their current generation. And that one too is also peeling off. Um, uh, take, take him beer to the bride. Um, they are peeling off, and any help we can get is very, very much welcome. Okay, so let me end here uh, by saying that Uganda is an independent country. It, however, has a complex modernism whose roots go beyond her borders. This is because the actors, and these included students and instructors, who have produced it are as national as they are multinational. They are as multicultural as they are multiracial. As such, Ntiro may be Tanzanian or Tanganyikan, but his practice is as Ugandan as it is Tanganyikan and Tanzanian. All this is because of the art school Mrs. Mago Trao created in Makere University to produce art masters for Uganda and the region. I thank you. So welcome uh, Professor Christina Young to come up now and share her work on conservation with regard to this collection. Thank you. So I had the great pleasure when, um, via another route through, actually through the Getty Foundation, um, I was put in contact with Kate um, for the conservation of one of the works that isn't here tonight because it's relatively uh, fragile to, to bring across from Glasgow at the moment. Uh, and before the conservation can take place and to understand the work better, uh, we were asked to, to do a technical examination. Uh, and this has led for me uh, a new area in terms of my understanding of African modernist art. Um, I've been working more recently on, on other artists. Uh, and I think the thing about this, and actually coming through from what's, what, what's been said by Angelo, is you not, not have any expectations of what you expect to see when you look under the microscope in these works. So I'm just going to talk you through the one work, uh, cutting wood work, which isn't here tonight, uh, and what we found and, um, and the questions that it's brought up. Just make sure it gets right away. So the, the, the question is, you, you may have noticed the date of 1967 on, on the slides that were shown before. And actually, in discussions in the last week, that date is probably not correct. It's probably earlier. And so that's one of the, one of the issues is, when, when did Sam Taro paint this painting? What part of his creative career was this painted in? Um, it's, and it's actually, you know, it's starting from scratch. What kind of canvas was it? Was, was this painted on, on a kind of a local canvas? We know also he had materials we learned from Angelo. His materials came from Cullerman that were in the UK, who were based actually in London. But does that mean that particular canvas came from those suppliers or was, was a local canvas? And what was the material? Um, has it a priming layer? There's an assumption that maybe it has a layer uh, below the uh, decorative paint layers, but we don't actually know that. Um, what's the, is the media actually oil? Uh, and we'll come back to that one later. Which pigments did he choose to use? What was the color palette he, he was using and the techniques of applying that paint? Uh, and also one we'll talk about is the need for conservation and what's causing the flaking of this particular work and how can we best then conserve that? And I, I should say that I, I'm not responsible for that conservation. Luckily, I can hand that over to one of our uh, colleagues, uh, it, not in Glasgow, but she's based in Glasgow, but not at Glasgow University, uh, who'll be working on this, this work. Um, so this, I'm showing you this image here, which is what's called a raking light image, so we have to shine light from the side of the painting. And what that does do, and, and luckily because it's not here, it helps to see the three-dimensionality of the painting, and you can see the impasta of the paint. 
Uh, so it's, it's not a flat object by any means. It has impasto. And these interesting um, areas here, which we, I think, actually, Angela, you feel like paint scrapings almost from the palette. And I can show you some close-ups in a minute. So this painting has many layers within it, although actually it's quite thinly painted. There's quite a construction of the painting itself. So by looking at Reiki light, we get to understand the kind of the painterliness of the brush strokes and the materials that are on that painting as well. So just to pin out point, a few of those that we see on the painting itself. One of those is, just get the pointer here. So just so you can see a little closer from the painting, you're starting to see the brush strokes, and I've got some more close-ups of this. Uh, and here, the colours bits that are being used in the, in the trees, the, in the foliage of, of the trees. And then down here in the figure, the kind of the richness and the variation, the colour, and all the paint and the technique of, of the brushwork in there. And then the, the, one of the reasons why it's not here tonight is this also delamination of the paint at a certain area in, in, in the painting itself. So that's by looking at the raking light at that that we can see that. Then we look a little closer down at a microscope, and I've took some images actually this afternoon that I did this. And this is actually, so you can start to see Ntara's technique here. We're seeing this, what we notice, we go um, back one, just quickly, if I can. If you look at the painting, when you see it fresh, you can probably see it here. There's areas that are shiny and areas that are, are matte. There's no varnish of visible on this painting at all. So that is actually, and again, makes it slightly more vulnerable. But there's a variation in the matteness and the glossiness of the paint that's definitely deliberate in his technique. And we, what we're seeing here is, the, is, the, is a part of a branch, which is a very flat, matte paint over a much glossier paint. So he was playing with this in his work. And another area where you can see the palette scrapings with, embedded in the paint, this is just one example in there. And again, you can see the kind of brushworks, the kind of vigorous brushworks, and the wet and wet, where the oil, we assume that this, these areas are oil, at least, oil paint where it's been wet before he added other layers. But then we come to other parts of the painting, and actually this is from the bottom right-hand side of the painting, where you can see there's an, a, a rich, median, media rich layer below, and then a, a much drier layer on top of that. And that's actually part of the tree trunk from one area of the painting. So it's actually from this area here, where you can see the tree trunk, the brown tree trunk, over this much darker, oilier layer below. And again, in another part of the painting, there's a deliberate choice to use different sites of, of paint or, and to let it dry, because here, although this is mixed, it's not mixed in with the layer below. So this layer's been allowed to dry before this upper layer of a much matter paint's been applied. So we're getting a sense of the technique for this painting, at least, that has been used. And the thing that I didn't say is it's the first one we've done technical examination on so far. There hasn't been any examination of Ntara's works at this level. So we're beginning to understand the technique by looking at this work and then, obviously, the, the beauty would be to look at more of these works in detail. And then again, just to show you kind of the damage, and I'll talk a little bit more in a minute, you can see there where we've got the lamination of this upper dry, dry layer, which is part of another tree trunk, to the lower blue layer below. So this is why the painting at the moment needs conservation to, um, to protect it. So another thing to look at is to understand the technique and the approach and how we reach this richness, richness of this painting. Um, and we mustn't forget the back of the painting. Um, and actually, it was quite, I think I was quite surprised when we heard this painting over had a backboard and go, oh, what's going on here? And you can see, and actually it looks really grainy for me, but I hope it looks, doesn't look that grainy for me. But you can see the red coming through here. Sorry, I'm going back again, it's flicking too fast there. Ah, come back, come back. Right, you can see the red at the back, and then this very vibrant, which actually happens to be cadmium, ye a red, yellow paint here, and a, and a yellow paint <coughs> coming through in quite... Uh, is it coming right through to the back of the painting. And the first thought was, well, there's an, uh, maybe another painting underneath. Um, but that's not quite what's going on, as I'll explain in a minute. But what we can also see is what, you know, is, is, is nice to see also just that this is how it, this has been on its stretcher. As far as we know, it's never been off this stretcher. So this is its original condition. So this is the edge of the painting, the original tax. Um, and... Uh, what I noticed today, because I had to go back and look at it, because, again, there's no assumptions I can make about this work, and to understand it, I had to go back. And what I noticed today when I looked at it, there's actually lots of what appears to be a glue priming layer that just comes over the edges of the painting, which you can't see here, but no sign of a white priming layer, which is quite important to this image. So this is the reverse, and that's the forward. But what I do, I've done is flip that image so that I can understand where that would be on the front of the painting. And hopefully, you'll be able to see 
if I overlap it, where in the painting these bits refer to. And what's interesting, if you look, and I had to spend hours going back and forth to see this, is actually you can see it's the legs. So that dark red is appearing in between where the legs are. It's quite hard to see from where I am. So you're seeing the dark underneath red. This red here is coming through, through here. So this was an underlayer that Entaro put down first, and then there's other layers. And this yellow coming through the back here is again, if we flick forward again, you can see the upper bodies. Now it's not, it's not over the whole body, but there's many layers going on here, building up, building up the layers. Um, there may be also, you know, changes in, in, the, in the composition that he's doing quite freehand as he's developing the painting. So it may be not predetermined at the, the, what the final image would be, but it's building up these layer structures that we can understand. And so that's, that's referring to the back to the front. By doing that, we could get to understand that. Um, um, so what's going on here and why is this doing this? So that another technique we can use to understand that is doing infrared reflectography. So in, when we do this, we use a, basically the equivalent of a tungsten light bulb, where you get the heat through and then you use an infrared camera. And um, the infrared can see through pigments to the layers that are in infrared absorbing materials, usually in conventional, so I should say, traditional 19th century British painting, you'd be looking at an underdrawing or an, or an early. And a, but we also use it in contemporary and modern art to just look at, help you see differences in the layers. So we're seeing through the upper paint layers here, to, so you can see through the bodies and into the lower layers. And what that helps us understand, as you can see here clearly, Ntara's painted this figure on top of the plank, sorry, on top of the wood block here. And then this wood block is painted on top of underneath here. So the, the way that the layers are built up one on top of each other, we can begin to get to understand that without, and this is all done non-destructively, so we've not taken any cross sections to look at the strophography. This is done purely by, uh, by non-invasive techniques to protect the painting. So we can start to see his technique of building layer upon layer, so not leaving reserve for the figures, but painting them on top of each other, and clearly being aware of what was underneath to create those images. Another thing to look at, we thought, well, let's see if we can see more with the X-ray of the painting. And actually, this is taking me a week of messing around with this to understand what was going on, because again, with an X-ray, it's just like your bones. It look, it, what you see are the dense parts, so in, or the nails in a painting you'd see, or other things. Or in the case of lead white paint, which is a very dense pigment, you see uh, underdrawing, sorry, you see modeling. So if it was, say, um, uh, if it was a face, often you see the underdraw, you see the modelling of the face. In this case, I looked at this and going, what's going on here? I said to myself, quite a few days. Um, so what I did again is it overlay that on the original image. It's not a complete x-ray of the whole painting, so when you put it on top, I, may, I put it in the exact position of the painting. And it actually, what I just think is going on, as far as I can tell, is this kind of dense area in the bottom left-hand corner, when you put it on the painting and you line it up, you can actually just about see the white, slightly white part of the figure here, is this figure here. And then you can see the this bit, which is, so this has got probably lead white, which we definitely know is in the painting, and I'll explain why later, maybe zinc white, so it's a dense pigment that we're seeing, not on, that he's using in the trees, but also in the figures. And you can just see them. And there's other things going on, with x-rays, it doesn't differentiate which layer you're looking at. So it's a build-up of layers. They're quite complicated to look at. Um, but when you look at that and then you overlay that on the painting itself in this, to this bottom right-hand corner, so it thought that all has there been a damage to the painting? Has something else gone on? No. That's, all it is is that he's built up the layers of white underneath. And it's probably because underneath, on here, this is the layer when you look at the painting. So I took a, today I took a closer image. There's lots of lead white here that he's painted in with yellow, cab, probably cadmium yellow in this particular case, and then in this area of the figure here. So this is actually purely because there's lots more of that pigment in, in the figures at the front rather than anything underneath the painting. Um, so it helps us understand again how he approached that. And probably the reason why he did that, well, we don't know for sure, is that he wanted, if you look at the way it's painted, that he wanted to block out what he had underneath, which was, of course, the, the logs, but he wanted a strong uh, figurative, you know, of, of the cloth of, of, the wear, of, of the people wearing here. So he had to use quite a lot of lead white to get that opacity in the paint. So that's why that looks like that. And you can see little <coughs> other areas uh, there. And again, with the trees, that's what's going on there. Um, there's one other technique that we can do non-destructively that helps us understand 
the pigments, and that's look at the elements uh, that the that that are present on a painting. And I don't have a picture of Sam and Taro, uh, the work that we did this week, but I do have a picture of one of my students last year, work, working at a very other really interesting artist who has lots of, in a sense, more modern uh, equivalent. Uh, History. Who's a who was born in Nairobi? Who's a British artist and has studios now. Michael Armitage between Nairobi and London. Uh, and this work, very lucky that National Gallery of Scotland have this work up on display. Uh, and we were asked to do a technical examination of this painting. And what we have here is an instrument called a, uh, an XRF. It looks at fluorescence by a non-destructive technique, and it tells you about the elements. And then we can deduce what the pigments may be based on those elements. So this is exactly the technique that we used for Michael Argy's work there, uh, and we've just used uh, in the last few weeks for our Sam Intaro work. And what we've been able to look at is what the, what the palette was he using. And I was talking to Angela again, is that his pigments probably and his materials probably came from the UK or could have been sourced from um, brown, uh, Rownies and um, Windsor and Newton. Uh, um, because at that period, the trade and artists' materials were going to many countries. And actually, again, it's an area that's not been studied. We know an awful lot about what happened between America and England and France and England. But no one's ever really looked at what happened outside those countries. And it's a whole... Anyone wants a PhD on colour and outside you know, Europe, it's, it's a whole field. I mean, and, and unfortunately, there aren't that many records. Uh, Winter Newton have a, um, a database, but other artists, there, uh, other colour men, there isn't. But again, that's something that could be looked into in more detail. And using the, the XRF, we can uh, work out what the elements are and then deduce from the colour that you see and, and the chemical composition of those colours what's the most likely pigment. So that yellow branch I showed you earlier on in a close-up is actually a cadmium yellow. So at this period, and we're talking, this is the question between late 1950s, 60s, these pigments were available. So we're not seeing anything that shouldn't be there, as in it's too modern, um, you know, so other pigments were came about later, so we know that that kind of still keeps it in the right period. These modern pigments of cadmiums that were coming around in the 40s and 50s, and it's quite consistent with the period. And also uh, Prussian blue in the sky that we see here. It's a mixture, so the wet and wet of the sky is a mixture of Prussian blue, zinc white, again, a relatively uh, modern pigment, and, but also traditional, much more traditional pigments, like lead white, which, of course, now is nearly hard to get hold of, but at that period was prevalent. In Cullerman. And this lovely vibrant cobalt blue here um, that you can see uh, in this area here that's been used almost as a single brush stroke or brush stroke rather than a mixture. And then and the more traditional kind of earth colours of an uh, iron oxide in, in the tree. Uh, and, then, and then again we've got a mixture of vermilion here in this, this, this coat here which looks kind of orange in what you've got is the, or, the brown of the iron oxide and the red of the vermilion. And then the much more of a dash Really, I love it. I, for some reason, I really like this dash of red because it just catches the, the shorts, what looks like a shorts. It may not be shorts. One minute, I've got to stop. I've got to, I've got to run out. i getting passionate about it. <laughs> anyway, so we just started, and we, this is non destructive We can look at my, and to understand his, uh, to hand his palette and help, and then look at other works by him to see how it may also change as, his, as time has gone on and previous to that. So the summary of many of the things I said, uh, I mean, at this stage, I think the, the sum, I mean, been thinking this through, and again, there's not many, you know, we're early stages, is that the de delamination may be because he used a, a paint which is called an alkyd paint that was available at that time, as well as oil paint. And we're getting a delamination at that paint, point in the painting. And that's really important to have an understanding of that. It will help the conservator make the right choice of uh, what's called consolidation of those paint layers. Uh, and also understand the technique of, of the artist. So that can, that's where we are at this pr present point. The actual damage on this painting looks like it's mechanical damage from a full something happening f from the front. Uh, so it's kind of a one-off thing. But it also shows there is a vulnerability within the paint layers that we need to address so that these paintings can be to be accessed in the future by, so that by preventive measures like glazing, backboarding. Thank you. It's such, a, such an awkward role that I've got tonight. Um, when, uh, so, so we, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, please, please take a, take a seat. And actually, I should sit as well, I think. Right, so I think it's time now to open the floor to questions. Uh, and I think I need to speak close to the mic. So um, we're going to ask people in the room if they've got any question and people online as well 
Um, so please um, don't hesitate. Um, yes, um, I think that someone will come with a, a microphone. Uh, thank you, Anna. <laughs> There. Um, I'd just like to ask the panel if you can tell us um, how many works by these artists are in the UK, just to give us a sense of... Mm. Mm. <laughs> there are others in the audience who might have expertise in this too. Um, <clears throat> this is a, this, with, in regard to African modernism, uh, this is a bit of an open question because this generation of artists' work are still very much being uncovered from people's collections or attics or other places. So um, I, you couldn't put a, a set figure on it, but Sam Antero is somebody who studied at the Slade uh, after he'd been at Macareri, so, and he had an exhibition in London at the Piccadilly Galleries, where, which he sold. Uh, he sold all his works. So we can kind of deduce from that that there must be more that we don't know about that are circulating or hidden away in people's private collections. Known Antero works, there's a cluster of them in Bristol in what was, I think, the um, Commonwealth uh, collection. Um, most of the... Uh, Jack Katarikawe... Is there one in London? There may be a Jack Katarikawe in London. I'm looking to Hannah to see if she knows. No. More likely to be private collections, exactly. So this is all to say, and I keep, so whenever I talk about this collection, I say, this is the most important collection of African modern art in Scotland. It is one of the most important clusters, certainly publicly owned clusters in the whole of the UK. It's something that, uh, and Hannah O'Leary is nodding here. She's an expert from Sotheby's, uh, so I really take that nod seriously. This is a really important cluster. It's something that our, our girl and beat should be immensely proud of, and it's something that Scotland and the UK should be immensely proud of. Is there yeah, a question online? We're going to alternate, maybe, if you don't mind. Yeah, so we've got a, a question online here from Jonathan, who has asked for Christina. If you could explain a little bit more on why you think uh, the, the Nadira we've got is earlier than 1967, based on your analysis. He's just wondering how you figured that out. Um, I, 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 it's actually coming from Angela and Kate that they suggested it is, and so what we're doing is trying to understand is there any markers to see whether that is actually the case. There's nothing to say it, sh ca it can't be earlier from, from what we've looked at, but again, it now requires us to now to look at other works by him, and the, the most likely work that we should be looking at is the work that's at MoMA, and MoMA have given me permission to go and do the technical examination in the future of that work, which, so we can build up that knowledge and understanding of where it fits in within his artistic practice. And, and also the kind of work ethos that um, you see in, 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 in the works are probably consistent with what he was interested in. And I think it was connected to the theme of independence in, in, in Tanzania, freedom and work. So this idea that you have a community or population and nobody supervising it and everybody is busy working away at the wood is probably consistent with his thinking that everybody was actively working to build the new country. And also they are close to what we have in Mackay University, which he did 1959, 1960, and 1961. They, are, they have all this consistency in people work and everybody works, people going to school, and nobody drops along the way, they all go to school. So um, this ideology of involvement and everybody is involved without force, I think, is in this work as it is in earlier works. The other, the other complication to the story is that the exhibition that he had in London in the late 1950s at the Piccadilly Gallery included a work called Cutting Wood in it. In the archives of the Harmon Foundation in Washington, DC, which a colleague in the US, Perrin Lathrop, made me aware of, there is a flyer that belonged to Intero from that exhibition, and next to cutting wood it says sold. This complicates things, because if it was sold in London, then surely it would have been in London, which is maybe where Mitchison bought it. But then we find a letter in the Argyle archives that shows that Intero sent it from Dar es Salaam to Argyle, so the quest continues, and this is where art historians and technical art history might together hopefully unlock the story of whether this is a mid-50s work or closer to the year that it arrived, which is 1967. 
I think we had a question in the in the room. Uh, yes, uh, can you take the microphone, please? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know if it's for Dr. Kate Coucher or Professor Angelo. Um, are you saying modern work as distinct from modernism, modernist, or are you saying this work is within the catch-all of European modernism, like the Bauhaus or you know the very conceptual modernist movement of Europe? Because it looks quite figurative and even a symbolist, some of it. So I wondered if you are actually recognizing that there is a difference, because people talk about modern and contemporary art, and the Piccadilly galleries was definitely never seen as a kind of modernist gallery when I worked in London. It was very figurative. So I can see that it's modern. I'm not saying it doesn't look modern for that time, but I just wondered where you're placing this within the canon of art history. Um, well, Andrew, you would, do you want to go first? Um, you um, yeah, tough question indeed. Uh, I think it is, um, and, and this has been uh, how the record has picked up these things. When it comes to uh, modernism in this region, and, and you find that the modern, modernism, contemporary, are sometimes used interchangeably. So we don't have, for example, where I come from, this strict um, identification of periods. Um, does it affect the art? No, it doesn't. Uh, does it affect the record? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, maybe I can just say that there is that um, um, reading, and there's that writing, which seems to overlap these words, and sometimes they are used interchangeably. I think the question uh, to build on uh, Angelo's kind of point about the complexity of terminologies speaks to uh, some of the very pressing and urgent discussions within um, academia and in museums as well about how we define works of art like this and who gets to say where the canon of mod modernity and modernism lies. Now, certainly the vast majority of histories of so-called modern art as they've been written here in the UK or in the US or other things place that locus in London or in Paris or in New York or other places. But a great scholar like Okwi Mweza or Olu Ogwibe or Chico Akeke, scholars from the African continent who've worked in the US or other places, would say that the idea that there is a single European center and everything else is peripheral is entirely relative to where your center is. So if your center is Kampala, London's pretty peripheral in your story. It's a part of the story. It's a part of the story. These are artists who are studying in, in Kampala and other places, and they're coming to London as well, and they're engaging the stories of modernism that are un unfolding in European centers of art making. But they come from places that have their own experiences of modernity, of the modern world, of what modern means, and they also have their own historic, important cultural traditions and ideas. And certainly the figure there's a very important exhibition recently in South Africa that talks about the centrality of the figure in modern and contemporary um, African art and arts of the African diaspora. The figure is something that in Europe there's a huge crisis about after the Second World War for all manner of reasons uh, linked to the kind of horrors of the Second World War. That crisis around the figure is not the same in every other place in the world. And on the African continent, we often see uh, African modernists using the figure as a way to really insist upon a visual presence in a modern moment. And in Tiro, as Angelo has eloquently uh, said to us here, the, the body in, in Tiro's paintings is so very important for seeing the Tanzanian state at work in its youngest, uh, in its youngest days, um, in the bodies of people collectively um, working for the for the new state, and that is unquestionably still a modernist work. It just doesn't quite, perhaps, fall the same way as it would be defined in Europe or otherwise. Um, I'd like to ask the organizer if we've got time for another question, or yeah, just one more, please. Uh, so I don't know in the in the room. Yeah, thank you. And apologies for the slightly shorter Q&A, but I wanted to leave some time to our speakers as well. Um, I was just curious, um, I know this collection is, is very large. Are, have you made contact with any of the other artists? Are they alive? Um, besides Natira, obviously. 
Uh, so Antero is, is sadly not uh, not alive. When, when did he pass away? Um, 1990 something, um, I think. Yeah, in the 1990s. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there are 12, the, I should say the collection as a whole, the, the Argyle collection is 173 works, I think that's correct. The African artworks are a small cluster of 12. They may at some point have had one or two additional artworks, but there are definitely 12 that we have today. Of those 12 artworks, there are two artists still alive. One is Professor Louis Azaria Mbaguni, who lives in the United States, and the other is um, Professor Catherine Nankia. Um, Katonoke Gombe, who is a professor in Uganda. And both of these individuals are now in their 80s, and we did manage to reach them through colleagues at Makerere and uh, contacts in Dar es Salaam and other places. And in both instances, they had not seen these artworks since they sold them as um, graduate students at Makerere University. And um, Professor Gombe, in particular, wrote a very beautiful description of her print and what it meant to her recalling memories of making it. It's a print called Youth, and it's all about her uncertainties of emerging in the world after her studies at Makarori. So we've been very grateful that we could contact those two artists and um, hope we might get yet more stories from them. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's incredibly difficult to place, especially the dates of birth and dates of death. Uh, right now we are struggling. When did Professor Cecil Todd die? Mm. And it's a big question uh, troubling us. We'll probably say, when did Mrs. Mago travel? Well, we can ask, they have, maybe they have children somewhere. So, um, yeah, death is a big thing in Africa and we always announce it. But if you are outside of the borders and you're probably far away, you probably won't pick it quickly. So um, the deaths are known indeed. When did Ntiro die? Uh, and can easily uh, be found, but you need to look for it. Uh, and we can find it, yeah. OK, so thank you very much to our uh, speakers tonight. I think it's uh, it's time now to, to wrap up. What's really annoying with Curious is that you leave the room with more questions than you had when you came in. <laughs> And uh, I think it's a, a true example here. So what I would like to suggest to all of you is that you scan the QR code, you go online, you listen to the fantastic podcasts that have been recorded as part of this amazing uh, project because obviously there's all sorts of public engagement elements to it. And uh, it's, it's really, I, suppose, I, I guess it's really the beginning of the story. And uh, this one, I hope, will continue for more travels, for more investigations and understanding of the exchange between um, our countries, our, our world. Uh, and also, I would like you to encourage tomorrow, if it's raining, to play the playlist that is on the website and it's going to lift your spirits. So. <laughs> Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you to Chris Nayang, Kate Kutcher, and uh, Angelo uh, Kakande. Thank you.